I spoke a couple weeks ago, as some of you may recall, on cleansing the temple. And uh, my conclusions were not so much referring to the physical cleaning of, of a building or anything like that, but the spiritual cleaning of the debris and the muck of sin that we so often allow to accumulate um, in the backs of our minds, in our lives, in our hearts. And today I'm going to talk about one of those things that needs to be cleaned out, and that is fear. We have a lot to be fearful of in these days. Um, the obvious elephant in the room, of course, is COVID. Our whole world is dealing with this potentially deadly disease. And by now, I think probably every one of us know people personally who've died of it. It has a tendency to mutate. The vaccines that we have, have that, that we've produced to fight it off, um, seem to be waning in their effectiveness. Uh, and they've been found to not entirely prevent the infection and the spread of the disease. And furthermore, those traits in the vaccines make them leaky, which means that since the virus can still continue to multiply um, in the vaccinated host, it's even more likely to mutate maybe again in the future. And not only that, the disease is found in cats and dogs and deer and a variety of other animals. So that means that since there's animal hosts, we're never going to completely eradicate it, like we've eradicated smallpox, for example. It's something we're going to have to learn to live with. Um, natural immunity from having a case of COVID appears to provide a little better and longer lasting immunity than the vaccines. But risking that natural immunity often means severe illness and can result in death and has for people, a lot of people. And then to compound that fear, we have a fear of maybe the government has expanded outside its legal bounds um, and appears very reluctant to relinquish that power. Uh, it's abusing us, its citizens, through questionably ethical or even legal vaccine mandates, through travel vaccine documents and other ways of segregating the population by vaccination status. There's a lot to fear. So can the church fit into this? We also know that there are risk factors when it comes to dying of COVID. If you become hospitalized, your highest risk factor they've found is obesity. Um, if you're obese and you're hospitalized, you're 30% more likely to die. And do you know what the second highest risk factor is, making you 28% more likely to die? Statistically, pretty similar. It's, it's not diabetes, it's not kidney disease or lung disease, it's not old age. The second highest thing is fear. Um, if you're fearful about COVID or just about other stuff in life, if you have a lot of fear and anxiety when you go into the hospital with COVID, you're 28% more likely to die. So fear is literally killing people today. And that's where the church can help. So what is fear? It goes by other common names in our society. No one goes around saying they're full of fear usually. It's called anxiety. And its related symptoms are, are stuff like depression, insomnia. These are spiritual problems. And that is a thing that God can help with. This is an area where the church can help. We are called as Christians not to be bound by fear. Our society is, is around us compounding this problem by raising even a, a new generation of children in this fear. Studies are showing that up to one in four children, that's 25% of our kids, are living in fear and depression right now. And that seems bad. That's... that's more than double what it was before the pandemic. So it's a big increase. Um, and, and this is even though the chances of kids dying from COVID are actually pretty small. They're less than the chances of kids dying from the seasonal flu that comes around every year. Um, they're less than the chances of drowning, less than the chance of accident, um, or any other common killer of children, including suicide. 
Kids are much more likely to die from everything else. But these kids are living in fear, and they're not receiving the hope. So fear leads us into other problems. It leads us into seeking, seeking our safety from the government instead of from God. It leads us to seeking, um, seeking to medicate the side effects of the fear, medicating the anxiety, the depression. And, and we do that with harmful addictive behaviors, drugs, alcohol, pornography, violence, harmful media choices, and other abusive behavior. This is a spiritual problem when we should be seeking uh, God for our safety and our medication of these things. So let's turn briefly to Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 through 7. Philippians 4, 4 through 7. Okay, starting at verse 4 in chapter 4. Uh, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Let your, foreboding, or let your forbearing spirit be known to all men. The Lord is near. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, shall guard your hearts and mind in Christ Jesus. Do you see there in verse 5? Be anxious for nothing, but instead pray. That means we shouldn't be afraid of nothing. Right now, our, in our society, people are afraid, as, as I've shown. They're afraid of COVID. They're afraid of the vaccine. They're afraid of hospitals. They're afraid of losing their jobs. They're afraid of the government. They're afraid of governmental overreach. They're afraid of things like having to move because of all these other things. And they're even afraid that their church won't take a stand and will become irrelevant. Many churches are even afraid to write religious exemption letters for people who don't want the vaccine, despite clear and valid religious exemptions that can be made against the vaccine. Churches are fearful of these exemptions out of fear of the government and out of potential governmental retaliation. Churches are being careful to toe the government line so that they don't get shut down, be it over masking, social distancing, canceling services, or canceling religious events such as weddings and funerals. Is it any surprise that so many church congregations are in free fall today? The church isn't standing on the principles in this, on its principles, on the principles of God during this pandemic. The church doesn't seem to be addressing the needs of the congregants and its community, but it instead is focusing on obeying the mandates of the government. We're not standing on our higher authority, which we have from God. We're not sharing Jesus, and we're not ministering to the physical and spiritual needs of our congregants and the community when we cannot interface with them as human beings made in the image of God. And just a caveat here, I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to pin the blame on this church right here, but the church in general. Um, I, I am going to do, we're getting to that real quick. Thank you, Greta. <laughs> um, Jesus himself stroke, spoke strongly against fear in Matthew. And we're going to turn there in Matthew chapter 10, starting at verse 22. And we're going to read um, a little bit of a longer passage here because I think it's important to get this in context. Starting at verse 22, um, Jesus here in this passage is speaking to his disciples about persecution and what will come to them because of his name. And uh, the, it's not... It's not you know, you can't say that we're in the exact same position as the disciples, but there's a lot of parallels, I think. He says, uh, You will be hated by all on account of my name, but it is the one who has endured to the end who will be saved. But whenever they persecute you in this city, flee to the next, for truly I say to you, 
You shall not finish going through the cities of Israel until the Son of Man comes. A disciple is not above his teacher, nor a slave above his master. It is enough for the disciple that he become as his teacher and the slave as his master. If they have called the head of the house Beelzebul, how much more are the members of his household? Therefore, do not fear them, for there is nothing covered, nothing covered that will not be revealed and hidden that will not be made known. What I tell you in the darkness, speak in the light. And what you hear whispered in your ear, proclaim on the housetops. And do not fear those who kill the body, but are unable to kill the soul. But rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a cent? And yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. But the very hairs of your head are numbered. Therefore, do not fear. You are of more value than many sparrows. Everyone, therefore, who shall confess me before men, I will also confess before him, or confess him before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever shall deny me before men, I will also deny him before my Father who is in heaven. We need to stop kowtowing to these petty dictators. I'm not saying that we should not mask. I'm not saying that we should get a vaccine, or that we should not. Or that, I'm not saying that we should not get a vaccine, and I'm not saying that we should strive to protect. That we should not strive to protect each other from the virus. Um, but we can do all this, and we should, and we can and should <coughs> act in prudence and intelligence. But living and acting in fear is ungodly. Got that? We, we, can, we can take protective measures, whatever needs to be taken. But we can't be living and acting in fear. That's the sin that we need to repent of. So how do we support not living in fear? We can start here in our church. But that is only a start. That only reaches the 25 or 30 people who come here every Sunday. We need to take this message to the streets. This is the gospel, that we don't need to live in fear because we are saved through, from death through the blood of Jesus. And that, that's big. We can preach this message against fear when you go to school board meetings to protest our schools taking state money to pay to teach our children things that are clearly ungodly. We can preach it to our local government and to our representatives and senators. Preach it to your friends that you see in the grocery store. Preach it when standing in support of those who are brave enough to lose their jobs over lawless or dictatorial mandates. Preach it when protesting government overreach. Preach it in the hospital when you are sick or even sick and dying of COVID. We have nothing to fear. We have to preach it inside these four walls, and then we have to preach it outside these walls. Again, as Christians, we have nothing to fear. We don't need to fear death, because not even death can separate us from Christ. Turn in your Bibles with me to 2 Timothy now. We'll see what Paul says. Somewhere toward the back here is 2 Timothy. Second Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. And Paul is writing this. Um, it's, it's one of Paul's great run-on sentences that he was pretty good at. Um, to his student Timothy, while well, he was stuck in a Roman prison for his faith. Uh, starting in verse 7, and we're going to read through verse 11. So second, oh, I'm sorry. 2 Timothy chapter 1, chapter 1, verses um, 7 through 11. For God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but of power and love and discipline. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord or of me, his prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel according to the power of God who has saved us 
and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was granted us in Christ Jesus from all eternity. But now has been revealed by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, for which I was appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher. So, first, you know, in verse 7 it says, For God has not given us a spirit of timidity. That, that means fear, and, and in many different translations, it actually is just translated as fear. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and discipline. Um, and further on there, he's abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. We have some awesome, awesome promises and reasons not to fear. We are given the opposite of fear by God. If we have fear, it's not from God, and we need to work to reject it, and the Holy Spirit can help us do that. Those forces outside these walls, they may try and silence us, bully us, and intimidate us, but if we can stand now, we will not only save ourselves, but we can save our entire community and even our state and our country for God. God has given us in this country a religious freedom. And that religious freedom as Christians, it's, it's like a talent to us from God. Remember the talent, uh, the parable of the talents in, in Matthew chapter 25? This is our special gift from God um, where we are, this, this gift of, of religious freedom. Are we spreading and multiplying it? Or are we sealing it in a jar and burying it, living in fear of our governmental masters? Now is not the time for us to fear our, our government. Now is not the time to fear the media or, or anything else out there that, that may be telling us to fear in opposition of God. Um, now is the time for us to stand against fear and spread and multiply to others the talent that we have of love, and hope, and the hope that we have. We have this, this gift to be free from fear. We have this gift of love, of hope. And, and we have this gift in our country to be able to share that. And we need to take advantage of that. So while we are preaching truth and fear, we need to stand with and support our friends and neighbors who may be losing their jobs, risking their socially correct reputations, they may even be going hungry or homeless in these difficult times. They may be getting sick. They may even be dying of COVID. We have nothing to fear, not even death, and we have everything to gain. So let's, let's stand with, with those people in our community who need our help um, and, and help, help, help everyone through that. That's how we show God's love. Skipping to the end, let's go to Revelation chapter 21. If you go to the back page of your Bible and then turn back one page, you'll probably be pretty close to there. Revelation chapter 21, verses 7 and 8. He who overcomes shall inherit these things. And I will be his God, and he will be my son. But for the cowardly, and unbelieving, and abominable, and murderers, and immoral persons, and sorcerers, and idolaters, and all liars, their part will be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is a second death. So that's, there is a list of the dastardly people who end up in the lake of fire. And the list starts with the cowardly. Let us not be on that list. Um, let's not live in fear and, and, and being fearful to stand for what's right. For most of us, our mission field is not in deepest, darkest Africa or somewhere else. It's right here in this town. Right here among our friends and our neighbors, our acquaintances, our family. Um, remember back three weeks ago when, when Mike and I and, and some of my family weren't here. We were, we were off with a group at 
at uh, our ranch doing Hope Camp. And we were trying to share some hope with people who came from out of town looking to drown their hopelessness in a big weekend party. Well, that same hope and light needs to be shared right here in Goldendale, too. This is our moment to share hope, hope and love in the midst of fear. Let's not waste it. Our cleansed temple is a place where we have banished the idol of fear. It is a place where we have hope, not only here in Goldendale, but in the midst of the pandemic, or in the midst of the pandemic, but also hope even beyond death, which is a great hope indeed. So um, we're going to close in a prayer, a prayer of repentance from our sin of fear and a prayer of thankfulness for the hope that we have in Christ. As we go to prayer, examine in your heart if there are things that you need to clean in your life, if there are things that you're fearful of that you need to repent of and turn over to God. God's bigger than those fears, and he loves you, and he's given you a blessed hope. And, and he, through his grace, he will help you overcome. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for, for conquering death and conquering it, um, not, just, not just your son, Lord, but, but taking that same grace of conquering death through Christ and, and allowing us to share in that so that we have that hope of eternal life, um, that hope that says, boy, no matter what may seem to be crumbling down around us, in our families and in our relationships and society or, or in the risk of, of disease, Lord. You're, you're there. You're that hope. We need not fear when we trust in you. And Lord, um, I repent and uh, I, I am sorry that I lived in fear and I am sorry that um, we are all guilty, Lord, of living in fear sometimes and letting fear rule our actions instead of turning first to you and saying, what would you have us do? And Lord, I ask that you will give us that strength to overcome, that strength to reach beyond the fear when new situations arise. Um, help us to, to have that strength to reach out to that neighbor, that friend, um, whoever it is that, that you may be calling us or bringing us into interaction with so that we can speak to them about your hope. And uh, your grace, Lord, your forgiveness of sins. And uh, Lord, we just ask for, for your spirit to help us through this. We need your help. This is not something we can do on our own. This is not something that our church can do, or, or even all the churches in town. Not without you, Lord. We need your, your help. We need your grace. And we need your strength. Thank you for forgiving us. Thank you for, um, for working with us even though we are flawed creatures. And for um, working to make us uh, into the likeness of your son. Help us to keep striving to do that. We ask this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen.